So now we're looking at gene regulation in eukaryotic organisms. And one of the main things to hold on to is that eukaryotic organisms are a lot more complex than prokaryotic organisms. And it turns out that it's believed that gene regulation is the reason that eukaryotic organisms are able to be much more complex. So we do want to note that, that gene regulation allows for differentiation. So in a prokaryotic organism, you have one cell, and that cell is all you have. In a eukaryote, you're, you sh you're often multicellular. So gene regulation allows for differentiation. Every cell in the organism has the same genome the same set of genes, and we call that a genome. So every cell has the same genome, but it's going to be expressed differently. And so what, we, what do we mean by expressed differently? Well, sometimes we mean different genes are expressed. So which genes? And sometimes we mean when. So if you look at the Drosophila melanogaster that we're going to get to be real friendly with, um, this fruit fly goes through a metamorphosis, a complex life cycle. And so we're going to see that certain genes are only active during certain parts of its life cycle. Other times we need to respond to the environment. So something arrives in the environment. And so we are going to see that a lot of this regulation is mainly in response. So it's a response to something that has changed in the environment. And so you notice this idea of a signal. In order for these levels of regulation, and there are seven levels in a eukaryotic cell, in order for these seven levels to occur at any time, it's usually based on some sort of signal. What we have here at the beginning is just a list of the seven main steps or stages, basically opportunities for gene regulation. So what you're going to want to do is try to kind of memorize these. And it helps if you kind of think of protein synthesis from the beginning to the end. And you'll be able to kind of identify when we could regulate it. So packing and unpacking the DNA is going to be before transcription. Then we have transcription. Then we have post-transcriptional modification. And then we have RNA transport. And we kind of consider this pre-translation. So if you can remember that protein synthesis is transcription and translation, then you can kind of think of all the different stages at which we could control this series of reactions. So we could control it before transcription even happens. We can control it after transcription. We can control it before translation. We can occur, uh, it can occur after translation. That's the protein processing making sure that it folds, and then we can actually regulate the protein itself. So these are kind of just the seven stages. We want to get into what each of those stages are. So the first is unpacked or packaged DNA. So we have to keep in mind that even though DNA is a double helix, it is going to be organized. And we kind of know this, we recognize a chromosome structure. And what we're going to see is that we have something called euchromatin and we have something called heterochromatin. If you remember from the cell division unit, we talked about chromatin is relaxed. This is going to be DNA when we are able to express it. If the DNA is packaged or coiled, it's hard to get into the actual nucleotide sequence. So packaging the DNA is actually a way to 
decrease the amount of transcription. I can't transcribe it if I can't get to the sequence. So what happens is that if I'm not going to use that sequence, I can package it around what are called histones. And histones are, here we go, histones are positively charged proteins. Now, why does it matter what their charge is? Remember, the backbone of DNA is a negative charge. So this makes sense. They're going to kind of stick together. And so we actually call this methylation of DNA. Methylation is when we add methyl groups, and that's CH3, to coil DNA tighter. So, if I want to increase or decrease transcription, if I want to increase protein synthesis or decrease protein synthesis, I can do it at the very beginning by controlling the amount of access to the DNA. And I control the access to the DNA by either packaging it up into what's called a heterochromatin, and that's known as wrapping it around histones and methylating it. And sometimes this is even permanent. So if you remember bar bodies, what happens to the extra X chromosome in women? That actually gets permanently inactivated. If I want, if I'm packaged and I want to loosen it up, I acetylate my histones. And this is going to loosen the histones, and so I'm going to have increased transcription. So the first place that I can regulate protein synthesis or transcription is at the DNA level. Next we have controlling whether the process of transcription actually happens. And in order for transcription to actually happen, I have to somehow attract RNA polymerase. So the whole goal of transcription is to have RNA polymerase there to base pair and create mRNA. So how do I attract RNA polymerase? Well, there are two ways. We have a DNA region upstream called an enhancer. And what's going to happen is that that enhancer is going to attract transcription factors. And these are going to mainly be proteins that bind to the enhancer to attract RNA polymerase. So I have a region of DNA. Now keep in mind it's upstream. This is not transcribed. But once I attract RNA polymerase, the rest will be transcribed. So that's why we've been looking at what an actual promoter looks like. So we need to know that the DNA region is called an enhancer. And that the, this combination of proteins are called transcription factors. And usually there's some sort of, again, signaling molecule. So it's either the signaling molecule itself, or it's the result of a signal amplification. We will sometimes see repressors. So just like we talked about repressors in operons, we will see some eukaryotic repressors. But it turns out that the main pattern isn't to repress, but to enhance. So in eukaryotic, we see here that it's more about enhancing regions rather than repressing regions. Next, we move on to talk about what happens after transcription. And we've already talked a lot about this. We've talked about post-transcriptional modifications. So this is the excision of, not exons, the excision 
division of introns. Introns interfere. And the joining or the splicing of exons. So I did this on purpose. Don't get confused. Exons are expressed. Introns are removed. They interfere, so where they're removed. Now the interesting thing is, how is this regulation? Well, this is regulation in that we can have what are called alternate RNA transcripts. So I might make this one, or I might make this one. And I can control my response based on which transcript I actually make. Keep in mind, we are going to be adding the tails and the five prime caps. So go back and look a little bit more at this section. But it's all about, I can create different transcripts. So I'm not going to stop anything here. I'm just going to control or regulate which form I'm making here. And those are called alternate or alternative transcripts. The next one is a really interesting one that someone won the Nobel Prize for. And what has been discovered is what are called small interfering RNAs. So it turns out that if I have already made an mRNA, that I want to stop it, or I want to control how long. Keep in mind, an mRNA can be run through a ribosome multiple times. When it's done at the ribosome, it doesn't disintegrate necessarily. It can be used again and again. So we do want to have some level of control over how long that mRNA is around for. So what they've discovered is what are called small interfering RNAs. Small interfering RNAs. And they are going to be small segments. They are RNA, small RNA segments that bind and degrade mRNA. So if I don't want this mRNA anymore, I can destroy it right away. I have specific RNA sequences that will help bind to it and help degrade it. So we need to know small interfering RNA and that it's affecting the mRNA before translation. Now real quickly, because RNA acts as an enzyme, if I block the active sites, I won't have translation. Easy as that. So I can block it at the DNA level before transcription, during transcription, after transcription, while the mRNA is being transported, I can block it at translation. I can somehow damage the ribosome or block the ribosome. Then what we have is a polypeptide chain. In order to have a protein, I have to have it fold correctly. Remember those levels of protein folding? And so protein processing is actually going from polypeptide to protein. And this is a place where I can regulate. I can control whether this happens or not. The cell can control. We have chaperones that are going to help me fold into the right shape. I can denature it. I can damage it. I can control that polypeptide. Finally, the last one, another exciting Nobel Prize delivery, is how do I get rid of a protein once I have it? And so, we need to know that if I have a protein that I want to get rid of, I tag it with ubiquitin. You do need to know that name. It's a chemical that tags the protein. And then we actually have a specific organelle, this is new, the proteosome, that will digest that protein. And I can use those amino acids to build something else. But what I've done is I have broken down a specific protein. And ubiquitin is the tag. And proteasome is what actually degrades it. So these are your levels. So what we have to do is kind of take a second, remember all the different steps that have to do with protein synthesis, and identify how we could control protein synthesis. Big ones to pay attention to are small interfering RNA and protein degradation.